Hello everyone, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Bianca Collins. I'm the curator of public programs for the Fowler Museum at UCLA. Fowler Museum's doors reopen to the public on July 1 and we are thrilled to be welcoming visitors back to the galleries. But for now, we are continuing to offer our programs virtually. So thank you for joining us today or tonight, depending on where it is you're tuning in from around the world. The Fowler is proud to be presenting today's program as part of our Lunch and Learn series, which offers easily digestible explorations of charismatic objects from around the world. I'm so pleased that you joined us to chew on some sustenance and feed your mind during your lunch break. Today we are joined by Erica P. Jones, the Fowler's Curator of African Arts, who will offer a discussion about three thrones made in the Cameroon Grassfields Kingdom of Kejum Katinga. Likely carved in a palace workshop in the late 19th or 20th century, these thrones embody the complexities of the art market during the colonial period and the ways the meaning of African art shifted once they arrived in Europe. Erica P. Jones is Curator of African Arts at the Fowler Museum at UCLA. She received her PhD in art history at UCLA, specializing in African art. Since joining Fowler Museum in 2015, Jones has organized multiple exhibitions, among them, Hansula for Life, Muleko Mokosi, Bread, Butter and Power in 2018, Inheritance, recent video art from Africa in 2019, and On Display in the Walled City, the Nigerian Pavilion at the British Empire Exhibition 1924 to 1925 in 2019. Her publishing has been focused on the arts and museums of the grass fields. She is author of the book accompanying the exhibition, Bread, Butter, and Power. Before we get going, two quick technical bits of housekeeping. Once Erica's screen sharing begins, I encourage you to click view options at the top of your screen and select side by side mode so her video feed doesn't cover any of the presentation. And if you have any questions during this program, please do submit them through the Q&A function found at the bottom of your Zoom screen to be considered to be answered at the end of the program. Okay, that's enough from me. Over to you, Erica. Thank you so much, Bianca. Uh, I want to thank everyone for joining us for today's Lunch and Learn presentation. I'm going to dive right in. Um, my presentation today represents some preliminary research that I've done on these three thrones from the Cameroon grass fields in the collection of the Fowler Museum. So let me share my screen. And we'll get started. Okay, you always got to start with the map. Um, I want to start by introducing you to the region of the Cameroon grass fields. Um, you know, the grass fields are this lush region that is home to, to many, many uh, cultural groups. So um, uh, overlaid on this map of cultural groups of the region is really a quilt of kingdoms. And so what you see here is all of these names, Kom and So Bamum, these are all cultural groups and also kingdoms. Um, and and these, these kingdoms have really controlled this region for, for centuries. Um, as a result of the region's tangled colonial past, half of the people, uh, those living in the Northwest, Northwest province, as you see here in green, uh, speak English. And the other half in the West region speak French. Um, and so the West region are the two sort of ochre and yellow colors at the, the bottom here. Uh, all three of the thrones I will speak about today are in the style of artists from the kingdom of Kejom Katinga. And you see that with the red dot here. Um, Kejom Katinga is also known as Babanki Tungo, and uh, it's located in the Northwest. So we all now we're all situated. Um, I should state here, this is something that I don't want this to be confusing later on, so I'm just gonna put it out. It's, um, there are two Kejom kingdoms, <laughs> um, the kingdom of Kejom Keku and Kejom Katinga, and the latter, Kejom Katinga that I'll be speaking about, they broke away from the former in the 19th century. So I'm not gonna go into that whole political history, but just know that I will be speaking about both sort of collectively as the Kejom kingdoms and then specifically about Kejom Katinga. So currently there is um, quite a bit of civil strife going on that's been going on in this region since 2018 in the Northwest region. And given the current violence, um, communication with members of the palace or artist workshops has been impossible. And so today I'm just going to focus 
on what can be gleaned from archival records um, and objects carved in the Kejom style in collections in Europe and in the United States. So when we look to uh, the dispersal of Kejom carvings outside of the grass fields into museums in Europe, predominantly Germany and the UK, as well as to the United States, we begin to see how the Kejom courts, specifically the court of Kejom Katinga ruler Fonchu Asa, uh, utilize a longstanding practice of selling prestige objects that and deftly recalibrated their carving output to capitalize on exchanges with colonial forces. Um, taking this a step further, I'll then look at how these three thrones that we're looking at here, once out of the Cameroonian context, epitomize the way that the products of this kingdom went from being diplomatic envoys to representatives of broader colonial preconceptions and programs. Um, you know, many kingdoms that punctuate this region of Cameroon are known for their prodigious output of wood carvings, of metalwork, ceramics, beadwork, and you know, other art forms. It's really an incredible art producing region. Um, at the same time, warfare, the mobility of art and artists, as well as the practice of prestige, prestige exchanges means that many palace treasuries in this region were repositories for arts from throughout the entire region. Um, the Kejom style is one of the most well-represented styles of carving in grassfield palaces. And the preponderance of work is well-documented in the archival record. Um, there's a wonderful 1988 article written by art historian Chris Geary, who for anyone who's a scholar of the Cameroon grass fields, Chris Geary is one of those you know, incredible luminary scholars. Um, she quotes a German ethnologist named Bernard Unkerman who visited the kingdom of Bali in 1909. And one of the things that he noted specifically was that Kejom arts were just an in incredible prevalence in the palace. Um, so, you know, here just to sort of show some historical images of, of the spread of these, of the Kejom arts. Here is an image taken in Bali by uh, Gottlieb Friedrich Spellberg, Spellenberg rather, um, in either 1902 or 1903. And you can see, I've sort of pulled out this detail here and you have a stool that's carved in the Kejom style that's being used as a table. And I, I promise you that this is, you know, it's hard to see here, um, but it's it's very similar stool to the one that I've pulled out of another example, another museum's um, collection here, um, very similar style. Um, you know, this list goes beyond Bali, beyond what Ankerman noted to, um, uh, to another example. Here we have the chief of Nkambe seated on a stool that's carved in the very characteristic um, Kejom, it's called the bat head motif. And you see another, a good example, not the exact one he's sitting on, but an example on the right here. Um, finally, we have two carved beds, one photographed by Carl Leap in Mbengue in 1933, and a second one seen here on the right photographed in Bafut in the second half of the 20th century. And this is also likely the same bed that there's another photograph that was not quite as clear um, taken in 1910. So it'd been there for, for quite some time. Um, the dispersal of Kejom style royal furniture throughout the kingdoms of the Northwest region can be interpreted as an indication that they had been a popular source of prestige carvings for decades prior to the German colonial period that started in the last quarter of the 19th century. So <clears throat> it can be difficult to say sometimes whether something comes from Kejom Keku or Kejom Katinga, especially when we're talking about smaller size stools and beds like the ones that I've shown you here. Um, but we can say with some certainty that the Kejom style thrones like the three that I'll be speaking about here later um, were carved in the Kejom Katinga style starting in the early 20th century. So just doing this, just so you have a sense of the spelling. Um, Kejom Katinga had a succession of sculpture kings um, starting with Asa Yufani uh, who ruled in the 19th century, and then his son, Fanchu Asa, who I bolded here. Um, Fanchu Asa was on the throne when the kingdom received a visit from Bernard Ankerman, who after visiting Bali also visited um, Kejom Katinga in 1909. Fanchu Asa was also on the throne when he hosted a visit from Father Johann Emons in 1913, who photographed the king at work in his palace carving workshop. Um, so we have these two two photographs, this is the first one I'll show you. Um, according to Emmons, the king began as a mask carver and he decided to focus his carving on monumental thrones after admiring, 
let me get you an image here. Um, after admiring the remarkable sculptural thrones of King Enjoya's Bamum Palace, this is the, the Bamum are a local neighboring cultural group. Um, and these Bamum thrones, they have a large base with a beaded footrest and these two, you know, the two large figures. And these really stood out um, from the region's characteristic backless smaller stools. Here's the second image that Emmons took of Fanchu Asa. Um, so while an interest in the new um, in the new style may be the reason he shifted uh, the production of his palace workshop from masks to this type of throne, other factors likely would have influenced this decision. In the late 19th century, foreign items began to play an increasingly central role in the local trade of prestige goods. So these foreign goods, such as guns, beads, cloth, and brass rods, they didn't entirely supplant the local prestige products, but they did quickly outpace them in terms of desirability and value. Uh, consequently, while there would always be a local market for prestige goods, it seems likely that Fanchu Asa and his workshop saw the opportunity to expand production and to innovate to appeal to colonial collectors an attractive new market that was eager for local carving. As the market shifted and new buyers emerged, Fanchu Asa's workshop met the demand. Uh, European collectors in Cameroon were interested in objects that connoted a fantasy of pre-colonial period, you know, the pre-colonial period, um, which was really epitomized by royal arts to them. Um, and these thrones, like many objects carved by other sculpted, sculptor kings, are really appealing because they're doubly royal when you think about it. You know, th they, these are furniture, types of furniture that would be restricted to royal settings. They've also been carved by royalty. Um, so the voracious European clientele, first the Germans, um, and then after World War I, when the Germans lost, uh, Cameroon was then divided between the British and the French. Um, and Kajong uh, Katinga is in the, what was the British um, Southern Cameroons. Um, so, uh, you know, the British and the, and the Germans, they really dispersed Kajong arts throughout museums in Europe, and then eventually came to the United States. Uh, you know, it's been noted, that many of the thrones in foreign collections show no signs of use because they were produced primarily for foreign markets. Um, you know, in these examples, we see a workshop that is shifting, um, that is responding to the shifting economic and political forces. You know, and so to look at the Kejom Katinga objects in foreign museums, we must understand these objects. I'm going to quote someone who's written really brilliantly on these kinds of, of economic forces um, by the name of Zachary Kingdon. Um, so he I'm gonna quote here, not only as products of European imperialism and projects of acquisition, but also as the consequences of West Africans active and selective responses to the encounter with Europe and with particular Europeans against the backdrop of the European colonization of West Africa, end quote. So it seems that the palace workshop focused on large scale royal items to satisfy the demand of international markets. Um, while Kejom Katinga style throne was a local innovation that made a royal seat mutually intelligible to local and European prospective buyers. This tailoring to a European market is largely lost in translation to the foreign art market. You know, to examine this phenomenon, um, I'll look at these three thrones in the collection of the Fowler Museum at UCLA that came to the museum from the Wellcome Trust in 1965. All three examples follow the throne forms most closely associated with Fanchu Asa, which is the high back chair with two figures riding a leopard and the seat or those with the, the um, seated figure with the two elongated arms that terminate touching two smaller figures. So we have both of these two styles. Um, the first example, there we go, um, is in some ways the most and the least remarkable of the three. Um, the throne is the most skillfully carved of the three, and it is, there we go, um, an especially fine example of one of the main forms of throne construction coming out of Fanchu Asa's workshop. It's a wonderful amalgamation of the two forms that we see in one of the 1913 uh, images. We have the top that's very similar to the throne on the left, with the base that's very similar to the throne on the right, in the, or in the center in that image. Um, we don't have any records of its initial acquisition date in Cameroon, and the earliest record of sale was when Welcome's agent purchased it at a sale at Sotheby's 
um, on December 12th of 1933. The throne has a typically brand, bland description in the auction catalog. It's a massive Cameroon ceremonial chair, the back pierced and carved with leopards, the arms with equestrian figures riding leopards, the circular seat supported by four zones of pierced and carved mass. This lack of information characterizes the glut of African arts that came on the market in Europe during and after the 1920s. You know, at this point, over a decade had passed since Fanchu Asa's death, and it appears that any possible association with him or his kingdom is no longer part of the record, um, if it ever had been in the first place when it entered the European art market. There's really little else to say about the throne, other than to hypothesize that this was made much earlier than 1933, possibly during, possibly likely during Pancho Asa's reign as indicated by the skill of the carving. Um, moving on to our second example, uh, we see one way in which the art market took objects meant for sale and transformed them into something rare and elusive. Um, according to the Welcome Trust records, this throne was given to the British Museum by the trust, who then gave it back to the trust. Um, you know, there's sort of this weird circulation of objects once they're in Europe. Um, and in that movement, uh, the original purchase information was lost. And so all we have to go on is what was found on a torn label that was attached to the throne. Um, and I should say, we don't have this label anymore. This is something that Welcome's agents found back in the 1930s. Um, it read, throne chair of the kings of Mundingo, West Africa. Sorry, that didn't go forward. There we go. Here we have the documentation um, and I've, I've circled the, um, the pertinent passage. Um, then later on on this, it reads, um, taken with considerable risk from the king's residence and brought to England, possibly in 1908. On its face, this would indicate that this throne was looted. Um, just to say it bland, you know, uh, frankly. But breaking down these claims, it seems more likely after conferring with multiple Cameroonian uh, scholars that these, these claims are probably fabricated actually. Um, both the location and the, and the date are what throw these claims into doubt. The first claim that this came from the Kings of Mundingo is problematic because there is no kingdom of Mundingo as far as any of us knew. Um, in the grass fields. So this place is, is a made up place. Um, and it doesn't immediately sound like any other recognizable place name, I should say. So more likely this was an imagined term for a generic version of an African kingdom. I will say this anytime I talk about this throne publicly, if anyone attending today has, has come across this term in other contexts or has any other information that would you know throw light on this subject, I would be very interested to hear about it. Um, so the second red flag we have with this, this piece is the date. Um, it seems incredibly odd that a British individual will be looting a palace in what was a German colony at that time, because it was a German colony in 1908 still. Um, you know, at that point, the Germans were really well established. They had a military post that had been built um, in this part of the grass fields since 1902. Um, and so such, such an occurrence probably would not have gone unnoticed. Um, so while it is entirely possible that this throne was looted from a kingdom in the grass fields, it seemed perhaps more likely that this was a story made up to sensa sensationalize and increase the value of the throne. Um, so this story transforms the throne into something rare um, and it was likely viewed as more, you know, quote unquote authentic uh, because of the purported history of theft or subterfuge. It's really hard to say specifically because the language here is so ambiguous. Um, so here we have a museum object that tells us more about the European colonizer than the African community that created it. You know, if the museum collections, if museum collections are a result of the entanglements of objects, people, and institutions, then this label really um, speaks more to the role of the people and the institutions in shaping our understanding of an object than looking at the object itself does. Um, My final example today arrived in the UK in 1924 to be shown in the British Empire Exhibition. The British Empire Exhibition was a colonial expo uh, hosted at Wembley outside of London over the course of 1924 to 1925. One section known as the Walled City, um, we see here a postcard uh, depicting the Walled City, 
uh, contained pavilions dedicated to the products of Britain's West African colonies, which at that time included Nigeria, Ghana, and Sierra Leone, and the Gambia as well, but the Gambia did not participate. Um, among the installations in the Nigerian in the Nigeria pavilion, uh, which included rooms dedicated to mining and other extractive raw material industries, was an installation of the arts of colonial Nigeria. And here we have another postcard that was produced during the run of the, uh, the, the fair. This display included arts from throughout the colony, including the newly integrated Southern Cameroons, which were included, which included the Northwest region of the grass fields where Kejon Katinga is located. Four pieces of Cameroonian furniture stand out. Um, we have two tables, uh, one of which is also in the collection of the Fowler Museum today, and two thrones, which were also being used um, uh, as sort of stands for, for Ipa masks from another part of Nigeria. Um, and all, all four of these pieces of furniture are carved in the, uh, the Kejom Katinga style. Um, focusing on the thrones, it appears that the two thrones are in the two styles most clearly associated with Fanchu Asa again. So at this point, the king had been deceased for at least five years, uh, but it's clear that his style was still employed in the palace workshop. And we know that this one was carved closer to the time that it actually entered the UK, or we can assume it was. Um, so it's possible that the work is intentionally anachronistic, hearkening back to the period of perceived authenticity, which in this case was the German colonial period. Um, while there are no records, or at least none that I have found yet, uh, that, the, that detail, um, the detail of how the pieces were acquired, the uniformity of the thrones and the tables, would indicate that representatives probably purchased everything in one place at the same time and sent it all to Wembley for the exhibition. So in this selection, you know, we see a solidification of this newer style of throne as fulfilling this British idea of what um, was an authentic grass field style. So by displaying this as one of the sole arts representing the region of Cameroon, the Fanju Asa style becomes synonymous with the concept of the historical, royal, authentic Cameroon grass field in, in London, in the UK at this time. So, you know, now that we've looked at these three thrones, we've looked, you know, sort of, we're in this historical moment. I wanna bring us back to today um, and bring us back to, uh, to Cameroon. So returning to Cameroon, the reverberations of Fanchu Asa's work are still felt in Cameroon today. You know, these high back chairs, um, these thrones are still seen at many annual festivals that take place in the region. Um, in this image here, this is from the Babo, uh, Babungo Kingdom's annual Nikai in 2012. Um, and we see that there is a proliferation of high back thrones in the palace treasury that were brought out for visiting kings who are attending this festival. So while these are not in the Kejom Katinga style, it is the basic form, the idea of the carved wooden high back throne that today is an important part of palace furniture in this area. Um, at this point in my research on these thrones, you know, speaking to current members of the palace is imperative to understanding the historical trajectory of this carving tradition. Um, yet without those interviews, there's still much that can be learned about local markets from the diaspora of objects. You know, we see in the legacy of, Fanchu, of the Fanchu Asa style of Kejom Katinga throne, um, what we see is how the palace workshop codified his style and his legacy, um, which was replicated after his death as his kingdom continued to use royal arts as a means of exchange with European colonial travelers and administrators. You know, and the long-term reverberations of that work to promote himself and his kingdom is felt today in what we see in palaces across the Northwest region. Fanchu Asa didn't invent thrones. He didn't invent the concept of a monumental throne with a high back, but his style of carving a wooden throne from a single piece of wood continues to this day. And while few thrones in European and American collections bear his name, the ubiquity of thrones either carved by his hand or in his workshop before or after his death speaks to his successful marketing of his kingdom's arts. You know, throughout his, um, or, uh, through his carving, he supplied both local and foreign markets with something that was very desirable, uh, arts that embodied the wealth of a palace, 
the exclusivity of being carved by a king and the scale of something grand, all carved by skilled craftsmen. When looking at archival records, historical photographs, and the examples and collections today, we see a kingdom that effectively created its own style, which it was able to promote to eager foreign markets, solidifying their regional utility to local and foreign powers alike, therefore securing for itself a position of stability. So that, those are these three, these three thrones. I'll stop sharing my screen. Although I could leave those photos up and look at them all day. <laughs> Thank you so much, Erica, for sharing such fascinating information about these three thrones. Um, really, really interesting stuff. Uh, we've got a couple minutes left in our program. So let's get into some of these questions that have been um, asked of us in the Q&A portal. Um, I, I'm going to start with a question um, from Suzanne, who um, wishes to know if you've traveled to this part of the world, and if so, what locations and institutions you visited, and whether um, such sculptures are made for export today. Yeah, so I um I did my dissertation research in this in this region, not in specifically the kingdom of Kejong Katinga. I worked in some neighboring kingdoms of Babungo and Bafut and Mankon and then in Baham in another um, adjacent region. Uh, so I, I spent, you know, over a year there uh, doing research in the in the museums, in the palaces, and looking at the the contemporary um, engagement with with historical palace arts. And, um, you know, it, the grass fields is just this incredible art region where it is still, it's still vibrant. You know, it is, um, there are carvers in all of these palaces that I, I mean, that I was working in. And, um, and yeah, it's, it's incredibly productive. It's really, uh, it's, it's, it's astounding. So yes, there, there's a lot being made for export. There's a lot that's sold locally. Um, it's very, very active. And Mark actually has a question as well um, about uh, the style of the chairs. Um, this is the latest of the three, as you say, emulates the same style of figure carving as the earlier two, but it's also quite distinct in replacing the European style back with the figure with legs spread wide. So why would this later artist change the form of the back while remaining so true to the figural style? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. You start to see the um, this this form actually of the seated figure with the arms reaching out to the two uh, front figures. You start to see that actually during Fanchu Asa's reign as well. So that is something that was seen earlier on um, and then continued. So it was really sort of these these two different styles that we see here, where you have the the back with the seated figures riding leopards, and then the back with the um, the seated figure with the extended arms reaching out to the two front figures. Both of those are really seen from Fanchu Asa's time uh, on um, after after his death. And so it's um, it, it seems like for whatever reason, the, the one that has a more obvious back that's not the seated figure, that was potentially more popular. I don't know if that's that's a fair assumption because I haven't done a really extensive sort of inventory of all of these across German and UK museums. But I, I mean, when I find them, I tend to see that style more. It does seem that this the, the third example is just a little less popular. Um, so I don't think they necessarily changed it. Um, I think that it was just less common potentially. Got it. Um... Thank you. So David has a question um, about uh, some background on the Grassfield Kingdoms. Um, he notes that some are large, some are much smaller, and he's curious to know if you know how big um, the Kedjum Kingdom was before World War I. Was it relative to, say, Bali? Or Bonso, yeah, um, it was. It, it definitely was. It was significantly smaller than you know Bamo Morn. So it was. Um, I don't know exactly how big it is, but I do think of it as being actually probably smaller than than Bali as well. That it is on on the the smaller side because it um, sort of broke off from uh, from Kejam Keku, and then they moved into a much, actually a more fertile sort of like, um, the plains, the Indop plains, um, region. Uh, so it's, 
I'd have to look up the exact the exact size, but yes, um, they were in terms of political. They were they were sort of um, on all sides, surrounded by larger, more militaristically powerful kingdoms. And so this was another important part of why they were so engaged with these prestige goods. It was also part of um, you know diplomacy, I believe. Um, yeah. Okay, I think we might spend a couple minutes going over because we've got some really great questions here. Um, and if that's cool with you, I'm just going to squeeze in like yeah. one or two more. Go okay. for it. Okay. So, um, Michael Sheridan's um, talking about a debate um, between Hans Kloss and Nicholas Argenti about the meaning of human figures. Um, Kloss says that they show the dense network of social cooperation and in interdependence or solidarity and harmony. Argenti responds that the human figures represent slaves and the king's ability to sell people. And so they're more about a history of hierarchy and violence. Um, how do you interpret the meaning of the human figures on these thrones? You know, I, it's, a, it's a really good question. And I think, uh, I think that the reason that these are actually in some ways different from, from um, Kolos and Argenti's sort of conversation is because they're not really being, in my understanding, they're not really aimed at a local uh, population in the same way. So because of the intention of selling this to, you know, colonial forces to, to German or British uh, colonizers, you have an entirely different calculus coming in to play in terms of how, how human figures are gonna be read. So if you're looking at, if, if he is looking at Bamum examples where you also have human figures on this throne, it's sort of looking at what Europeans are looking for. And they are interested in this representation of, of human forms, of these figurative arts, that these are popular. And so it's perhaps less a question about, um, a question than thinking about these, these um, local understandings of whether it is about uh, you know control over other human beings or about social cooperation and more about what the what Europeans think human forms look like um, or the ap appeal of human forms to a market um, so but that is you know that's something that looking at this is you know because I'm looking at this from such a long historical remove it would be an interesting question to actually see if that has changed in the intervening, you know, hundred years from when these started to be made, and whether that whether because they're you know, human forms, this has been reintegrated into a local vocabulary of of um, iconographic interpretation. So, you know, so many different paths for ongoing research with these things. Yeah. They're so fascinating. Um and um. Can you speak to uh, the differences between the art styles of the East and Western um, grassroots kingdoms? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of overlap. Um, let's see, it's a, uh, <clears throat> it's a, uh, let's see, I mean, every, when you're looking at Grassfields kingdoms, there is a lot of overlap. There's a lot of, um, of, of movement of arts that are going to be influencing everyone else. And so, uh, you know, it's, it's really getting, I would say more, more into the nitty gritty to talk about these differences. <laughs> Sorry, my dog appears to be running into the street now. Um, <laughs> uh, I've entirely lost my train of thought on that one. <laughs> Sorry. It's all right. Well, maybe that's a good um, opportunity for us to wrap this up. Thank you so much for going over time with us, Erica. This was super interesting. There's a lot of open questions in here. So I'll be sure to share these back with you afterwards. So you can um, check out what people were asking and yeah. maybe even um, provide some answers if time permits. So thank you very much for your time today. Yeah. Thanks so much. It was my pleasure. And thank you to everyone who joined us today. This program has been recorded. It will be available immediately on the Fowler Museum's uh, Facebook for you guys to revisit and share. It'll be on our Instagram and on the Fowler Museum in the coming days. And we hope that you'll join us again next time for our next program next week on Monday. You can find more information on the closing slide. In the meantime, have a great week, have a good day, and I'll see you again next time.
Bye.